Yeah, yeah, it keeps getting better. It keeps getting better, man. Um, yeah, I was going to move on and get into some of these uh, seven tablets of creation. But hold on right quick. Hold on right quick, man. I want to get back into this Game of Thrones right quick. Um, look, man, the more we decipher it, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's even more validation. I want to dig on. I want to get back into my homegirl gray area. And then I want to ask a simple question. What is a cloud? What is a cloud? So we're going to jump right in. We're going to talk fireballs a little bit more. Then we're going to get a great document called uh, Antichrist Osiris, the History of the Luc Luciferian Conspiracy by Chris Reitz. Reitz. And uh, love to uh, my man uh, Moses, man. Uh, Thoth Moses. Thoth, hey, man, Thoth hit us with this one, man. <laughs> Thoth is in... Uh, Increasing our recon game, man. Love to Thoth Moses, man. He's, he's out there somewhere dropping, dropping, drop, man. <laughs> so, love to you, bro. Let's go, man. Let's go, man. All right, all right, all right. Man. All right, yeah. Let's get right into it. This is gray area. We didn't really get to hear a lot of it last time. We did it real quick. Again, this is fair use. You know what I'm saying? We're going to get some teachings, some criticisms, some comments, all right? Some scholarships and some researches, all right? All right, man, we're going to dig on it. Fair use. We're just digging on. We're just trying to pull some drop out of this comment game because get the last drop on the comments. I hope you got that. We're going to keep it going in this drop. So let's go. We know we're seeing comments all over the place. We understand already about the connection with the comet and the dragon. We understand that. We're going to get into these transient clouds next. All right, so let's go, man. Let's go. Let's go. Take it away, great area. Let go. Summer children, your mother is back with okay. some juice to get you through the long night. Okay. Lone wanderer on the trackless sky, companionless, say douse though fly, along thy solitary path, a flaming messenger of wrath, warning with thy portentous train of earthquake, plague, and battle pain. Some say that thou dost never fail to bring some evil in thy tale. Hmm. When we first see the red comet, it is when Daenerys hatches her dragons from stone. She takes the comet as a sign that she must step into the flames, and she does. But real world history has a very different view of comets, and we know our author George R. R. Martin is an avid history buff. And we know he has used history and mythology and real world juice to help him write this A Song of Ice and Fire series. As far as humans go back, comets were feared. They were omens of doom. Our author has a great way of tricking the reader. Daenerys was pregnant and she lost her son, the stallion who mounts the world. She had to lose her son to bore her dragons. And it was the red comet that she took as a good sign basically an end of the world prophecy in Christianity we have a passage that reads like this and there was seen another sign in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems and his tail drew the third part of the stars of the heaven and cast them to earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered that when she should be delivered, he might devour her son. Does that not sound like Daenerys when she birthed her dragons? If I included every time throughout history or mythology or in different religions that a comet was tied to some disaster, birth, or significant event, then we would be here all day. St. Peter Josephus recorded the nightly appearance of a comet over the city of Jerusalem just before the war which ended in destruction of the holy city. 
Beta the Vernable declared in the 17th century England that comets pretend revolutions of kingdoms, pestilence, war, winds, or heat. And many other people agreed. John of Damascus had the same belief. St. Thomas Aquinas believed it too. Albert the Great, one of the most noted saints during the Middle Ages, whose works are frequently referenced when you think theology, astrology, alchemy, zoology, and about every other ology ever, he had the same doctrine that a comet was a bad omen. Sacred books of India preach the same. Ancient yearbooks of China tell the appearance of comets and the disaster they foretold. King Louis of France died from fear of a comet. Sacred legends of Judaism have the belief that the star of Bethlehem is a comet that will herald. <laughs> and then, then we just bring this up and we was playing. It was like, you know, you know how to say, you know, and these places in the scripture whether you're talking old test or new test but and then when you get into the prophecy of like the kumse being born on the sign of a comet when he was born then you got the star of bethlehem situation which we know as a new test is a reflection of a, what really went down in your indigenous history all right so you got this teku meshe left to higher mark man and you know this is a sign of the birth of the Messiah, right so when they saw this dragon or comet, get the last drop so you can see the comet with the dragon face. And we went all into the definition of dragon as a meteor and all that. So yeah, man, we're just gonna, you know, we're just gonna keep it going. We're just gonna keep it going. Cause I man, this came on by accident. I was about to drop something else. And then, you know how how YouTube just uh goes like on autoplay. This this popped up and started playing. I said, What? What? So of course to some people you know the dragon is a it's a bad omen right to other on the flip side it's a it's a positive thing when you had the war like Tecumseh 1812 you got the the uh comet of Tecumseh then you got the Napoleon situation so you know they didn't mean the same thing to both parties Napoleon is getting ran out of Russia the same way that this she just said uh the king of France died for Fear, having fear of this dragon, fear of this comet. You don't just die because of a piece of, piece of uh, you know, meteor junk. You know what I mean? You're talking about dragon. The fear of this dragon literally killed this man, the king of France. Napoleon runs out of Russia. Russia's on fire. They say it's an unusual fire. It's burning every damn thing. I mean, some of these fires, man, when you look at the California fires, left to high con, higher mark, the dragon fires... They're they're burning everything. They're not just, you know, these type of fires are very, 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 very hot. Put it in simple terms. Hotter than normal fires. They're burning things that shouldn't be burnt. Yeah, man. So we got that last part, you know, where he said, oh, the red dragon. Oh, only means one thing, boy. Dragons, right? So. I'm bringing this out because my Ruwak is bringing this out. Clearly, it's, it started auto-playing on my laptop. That, nah, man, keep on this because we're about to, you know, some, 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 some tells me it's going to get really ramped up with these fireballs and these comments or these dragons. And you need to recognize the energy before they, you know, tell you what's going on. They're not going to tell you what's popping. But you need to know why they're spraying all this stuff, why they're doing all this stuff, the war that's being fought is a frequency war the coming of a messiah comments are tied the coming of a messiah let's get that part again of judaism have the belief that the star of bethlehem is a comet that will herald the coming of a messiah all right so with these mashiachs we know a dragon is always present Comments are tied to many people that changed history. Charlemagne, Merlin, Moses, Henry Tudor, Pontius Pilate, Alexander the Great, and the Peloponnesian War that lasted almost Moshe, let's go. 30 years. Sparta obliterated Athens while a comet hung in the sky. However, William the Conqueror ended the reign of the Anglo-Saxon King Harold and took England by conquest after he saw a comet and took it as a good sign and its presence is depicted on the Bayux tapestry. So now that I've taken you through a little history and knowing our author's love of history, why would we think this comet is a good sign? That it would bring forth something good? It won't. 
Also, our author is a self-proclaimed atheist, which in a nutshell means he doesn't believe in anything greater than ourselves. He doesn't believe in an afterlife. He doesn't believe in the end of the world. He doesn't believe in the end of the world prophecies or any messiahs or any saviors. In different Abrahamic religions or just religions in general, we are told of prophets and saviors and liberators and life after death. Many different religions have their different beliefs. And I think George R. R. Martin has drawn from all of them and scattered them throughout his story. When you look at Westeros and Essos as a whole, there are prophecies of such heroes. We have the most popular, which is Azor Ahai, which is believed to be the prince who was promised. So this Azor Ahai character is supposed to be like Preston John. He's the prince that is promised, like a King David. Let's go. We have the stallion who mounts the world. The Ronish have a hero. The Yatish have a legendary hero. Westeros has the last hero. It's unclear whether all of these saviors are all the same or derived all from one prophecy. And because of this, it actually makes me think that if the Red Comet was the bleeding red star of the Azor Ahai prophecy, then Azor Ahai may just be a myth like some kind of Raholar mythology, and Azor Ahai's occurrence is not likely. Its occurrence is so a- Preston John is a myth to some people. Come on, follow it. As likely as Ragnarok was for the Vikings. And if the Azor Ahai prophecy is real, then its occurrence may not bring something good. Knowing our author's backgrounds and belief, if we take revelation- And they keep saying bring something good. So something good to who? Because- it depends if this dragon can bring something prophetic good as a blessing or prophetic as a plague. Would it depends on how the creator is going to bless you or curse you. It's not the dragon. <laughs> it's the creator that sends fiery serpents, right? Fiery dragons. Seraph are the burning ones, the six-winged seraphim, highest orders of angels, bringing blessings or bringing curse. And you got Sodom and Gomorrah. Love to your auntie. We were just talking about this. Um, and uh, Irvin Reed as well. Man, love to the Templar. Literally, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, you got these, you know, couple angels, right? Or dragons. And Abraham says, oh, okay, okay. You know, what's going down? Elohim. Where y'all going? Oh, we about to go see Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, okay. Y'all on a war path. Got it. Got it. Y'all need anything? You good? All right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you got these two angels or fire breathing dragons that set fire and burn down this city so either it's a plague or you know destruction or it's a blessing you know what i mean in 1811 you got napoleon's comet you got tecumseh's comet same dragon that's burning down russia to get napoleon out there it's the same dragon that's dealing with tecumseh whose name literally means a shooting star or comet or meteor or a dragon a priest, a prester, is a dragon, is a meteor. And this frequency was rocking all the way with Moshe, all the way with Joshua, who is Quetzalcoatl. So, you know, you could look at one version of it and you could say, oh, demon, snake, devil. Well, you're looking at it like a Christian. Because even the Mayans know that, Kit even the Mormons know that Quetzalcoatl is the priest king that they even call Jesus Christ. Yeah, man, look it up. Latter-day Saints called Kitsukoto Jesus Christ. Oh, that was actually Jesus. No, that was Joshua. And you got to choose your Joshua and stop playing. Ain't no play play. Joshua's Joshua. You know what I mean? So this is dragon frequency. And you're seeing it in the skies. And this is the creator of Game of Thrones. Who they say is an atheist or whatever. But he knows his history, though. Revelations and the horsemen of revelations and the trumpets of revelations and the signs of the end of times. There have been many times throughout history where we thought this time was upon us and in actuality it wasn't. Which could be the same in this world that George R. R. Martin has made very realistic. Daenerys took the Red Comet as a good sign. She interpreted it like a conqueror, like William. She took it as a good sign, right? Because she's rocking with the dragon. And the conqueror. Then she followed the comet through the red waste and into Koth, sort of like the wise men following the North Star across the desert. Mm -hmm. So for her, this comet could have been a good omen or not. Because we don't know what balances the birth of dragons offset. 
let's take a look at some of the other characters and what was going on with them when the comet streaked across the sky. In Dragonstone, Maester Crescent observed the blood red comet from his balcony. He knew it was a bad omen, but he wasn't sure what it meant. He had just received a white raven that the longest summer in living memory, 10 years, 2 turns, and 16 days had came to an end. Dala told Shireen she heard Melisandre tell Selyse that it was the dragon's breath. Stannis is preparing for war. Melisandre sees victory in the flames. Selyse is pumping Stannis' head up, saying the comet means he is supposed to sail from Dragonstone like Aegon the Conqueror and conquer. She also says that Melisandre has looked into the flame and seen Renly's death. Maester Crescent tries to poison Melisandre but ends up poisoning herself. So on Dragonstone, the Red Comet brought nothing but death, false prophecy, kinslaying, the end of summer, and war. In King's Landing, it's Joffrey's name day, and Sansa notices the comet. Some people call it King Joffrey's Comet, some call it the Dragon's Tail. People are some people call it Napoleon's Comet, some people call it the Kunsay's Comet. Saying red for the Lannisters, it was sent to herald Joffrey's ascent to the throne and his triumph over his enemies. On this day, Tyrion arrived at King's Landing to become Hand. For the people in King's Landing, the comet brought war, hunger, summer's end, a bastard boy king to rule them all, death and war on the Blackwater. In Winterfell, Shaggy Dog and Summer are howling at the comet. Summer's howls were long and sad and full of grief, but shaggy dogs were more savage than that. Osha said the comet meant blood and fire and nothing sweet. Septon Shale said it was a sword that swept the season, beings as they received a white raven as well. Summer is over. Old Nan, the smartest of them all, had more of a singular answer. Dragons. The hounds in the kennels mm. barked furiously. Horses kicked in their stalls, and Maester Lewin had sleepless nights. The wolves know more than we think they know. Bran recalls the wolves howling in grief when he fell, and when he was in a coma, and when Rob left for war, they howled in mourning. They howled the night the raven brought the words of his father's deaths. The wolves had known, and Bran wondered as they howled at the comet who they were mourning now. At Castle Black, John and the Night's Watch were preparing to go beyond the wall. The Night's Watch had dubbed the Comet Giora's Torch and said it was sent to lead them through the Haunted Forest. And we know how that ended. In the Riverlands, Rob is refusing to trade Jamie for Arya and Sonya, but he has sent peace terms to Cersei. He has also went against Catelyn's advice and is making one of the biggest mistakes yet in sending Theon to treat with Balon. Some of the Blackfish's men call it the Red Messenger. The Great John says the comet mm -hmm. is the red flag of vengeance for Ned. Edmir thinks it means a great victory for River Run. He sees a fish in the tail and the tully colors red streaked across the blue sky. Catelyn wonders if the crimson is for the Lannisters. That thing is not crimson, nor Lannister red. That's blood up there, child, smeared across the sky. Our blood? or theirs. Was there ever a war where only one side bled? Was there ever a war with only one side bled? Man. So this comet or this dragon, I'm just playing this through, got one more minute on this, symbolizes something to everybody. In Revelations, you got the red dragon in that perspective of, you know, devouring this this mother, this celestial mother giving birth to a child, which we can interpret as, hold up, man, that's Zeus's child, or that's, you know, Zeus being born. Zeus is Jupiter. Jupiter, you know, astronomically speaking, you know what I'm saying, it's being, it's coming out of this, uh, what they call it, the, the Visica, Visica, Pisces, whatever it is, you know, in the horoscope thing, but it's literally being born, you know, at this time, coming out of this out the womb of the celestial mother if you go that route you know what i'm saying but either way you know the christians are taking this as oh they're devouring uh the the son right they're devouring this this male child we see the male child literally as jupiter literally as zeus 
And this dragon is devouring the hijacked Zeus in Revelations. Now, how do you flip the story? Everyone has a different flip story of this comet or this dragon. So when they come to you and they package the Revelations for you and give you their interpretation of this red dragon, you got to really be skeptical and know who's giving you their interpretation of this dragon. That's the only interpretation. What about Leviathan? What about Leviathan who becomes a canopy? A canopy of light for his people. Literally sacrifice. Oh, he must be the devil dragon connected with the... Remember, he got the seven heads too. Seven head dragon over here. Seven head dragon over there. Come on, man. Now you got two seven head dragons. One's being sacrificed. The dragons were sacrificed. You were sacrificed. You are the sacrifice. We know how that ended as well. So this comment was viewed by almost the whole damn cast of Game of Thrones and interpreted differently by all of them. We know that the comet's tale left evil, death, war, bloodshed, king slaying, kin slaying, houses rose and fell, battles were won and wars were lost. Kings were slaughtered, and the trident was red with blood. We know Melisandre thought it was the sign of Zor Ahai, but let's put this prophecy in perspective. If the comet is in fact the red star bleeding sign of Azor Ahai, then Azor Ahai will bring nothing but revolution, pestilence, war, heat, and wind. And it's likely that Azor Ahai is a myth that doesn't even matter. And that the saviors of Westeros will be no messiahs, no prince of promised prophecy, no heroic legends of past lives, no champions of the great other or champions of the Lord of Light, just humans surviving, just humans evolving, and just humans changing the world. I hope you guys liked this video. Hey man, we, we dug that gray area and, you know, just, you know, Flowing off of that, I mean, man. <laughs> so, you know, in other words, does the people of Westeros, Westeros represents the West, obviously. So we're talking about the Americas. And do you have a savior? Do you have a hero? Or is it going to be you that is your hero? And that's an interesting question, man. Love the gray area. You know what I mean? She has a lot of intel, man. This is what she do. Game of Thrones is what she do. She's the one that kind of got me uh, digging it because she got so deep in it. I was like, huh, okay, you know, all in the characters, the history. And then, you know, once you connect his story, then even George R. R. Martin is telling his story, man. It's his story. So you got to dig on his story. If you're going to dig on his story, you can dig on his story. And then he got a story. And then she got a story. Copyright. Disclaimer. Fair use. 107. All right. Comments, criticism. It's all good. We just did some research. Let go. All right. All right. That was good. That was good. That was the good. Um, yeah, you know, I think we saw some of this um, on another clip. But, you know, people are hearing things in the sky. And it's one thing connected to another, man. Are we talking dragons in the sky? They're being heard around the world, across the plain, right across the plain. So, you know, what is it, man? If it's not dragons then what the hell is it good grammar and spelling come on man you gonna hijack me like are important. Hijack, hijack, hijack. but if you want to write hijack, essays hijack, that hijack. inspire all right, all right. Listen, up. <laughs> listen up man it's gonna sound like trumpets man so you hear about the trumpets being sounded hey man let's go sound from all over the world <laughs> creepy right so yeah notice you got that sedona arizona shirt uh sedona is a major vortex man a major energy vortex check it out 
Yeah, man. I'm, um, you know, love the Costa Rica. Love the my homie Caramayo, man. Did you hear anything like this, my bro? Creepier, right? I mean, that sounds like something that's alive up there, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. So, um, you know, we've been digging on it, man. Love to again, the homie Thoth, man. Thoth, Thoth drops some drop, man. I want to dig on it right quick. You know, we're gonna talk about giants a little bit, man. We've been talking about that, uh, you know, more and more recently, man. The the book of Og again. Love to the family Dawi, man. Um, also. Natural by law, great drop. You're hunting, you poop print. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Get in the classroom, Caramayo. Get in the classroom, man. Please do that. And of course, we're just talking dragons. We're talking fireballs and everything else, right? I'm going to get this and then we're going to skip up. The god of the Aztecs was Kitsukoda. Now, we know that Kitsukoda was not their god. He is the Mash Mashiach, the Messiah, the Joshua of the Aztecs. Joshua. You know, was not worship. Joshua was, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, appreciated, love, you know, revered as a Mashiach, but not worship as God itself. But they deify us later. So when they come into it, they say, oh, you know, he was a God. Well, we are, that's what they would call Elohim. You know what I'm saying? Joshua being Kitsukoto, being a dragon, right? Being a, a fire where we at? Here we go. Being a dragon, right? Being a fierce, violent person, male or female, right? This man or woman is a dragon. Follow me now. But yeah, also Kitsukoto was known as the Rainbow Dragon. And you know, we have a rainbow covenant all throughout the scriptures. You know, you know when I put my bow in the clouds, right? My rainbow. This rainbow is literally a Quetzal. A Quetzal is where they're getting the name Quetzalcoatl. Coto. All right, Quetzal is a rainbow, a rainbow uh, bird, a lofty bird that only lives in cloud forests. Cloud forests are the forests that's way up in the clouds, like like Avatar. So they're high level cloud birds that are in the cloud, rainbows in the cloud. But Quetzalcoatl is a rainbow dragon. So whenever you saw the rainbow dragon, that is a sign of the covenant. What covenant? The covenant with Joshua. The covenant with Israel. The rainbow dragon. Man, it's all covenant, right? So, the God of the Aztecs or the Messiah, Mashiach of the Aztecs, after Moses, right? After Hawa Mak, is Quetzalcoatl. He had left them for centuries prior, but had promised to return one day. That's why the Mormons call Kitsukoto Jesus Christ. But we know that we're just talking Hawashua, Joshua, the Mashiach that led his people to the promised land. We're going to get back in the Papuva so you understand that Joshua, Kitsukoto, led his people to the promised land. Exactly the way that Joshua did. It's the same person right here, which is why the Mormons have to acknowledge him as their Christ, their anointed. But we're talking about our anointed. Our messenger, right? Like they call it the Red Comet, the Red Messenger. Now he left them and promised to return like who? Jesus. So where are they getting the story from? You have to come home. Get out the phantoms and the duplicates. You know where home is at. Stop playing. Ain't no time for confusion. Stop playing. You are the Aztec. You have a priest king. We know who we are here. We know what language we speak. We don't speak Greek. We don't speak Christ. We don't speak Jesus. Zeus, Zeus, Zeus. We don't speak Zeus. We're talking Quetzalcoatl. We're talking Mashiach. We're talking Hawashua. Get it clear. He had left them centuries, promised to return. And then that's when you get the story of these white people coming over in boats and them thinking, oh, okay, you, this, this match, this might be matching the prophecy of the returning of Kitsukoto as the 
anniversary of his birth year known as one reed love to my family Irvin reed man but he's talking about the sea of reeds right the reed sea the red sea neared the aztec king montezuma and his people feared strange omens we just got these red omens right dragons in the sky right comets right Strange omens appeared, such as fireballs in the sky. So we got the whole Tecumse drop with the fireball. Alright. Shooting star, Tecumse. Alright, you can go back to the Hawathas. And of course, when you go back to the Hawathas, you're pretty much hitting this period right here in the 1500s. Which again connects to this omen or this dragon or these fireballs in the sky. Remember, man. When we talk dragon, this is from the Russian Dolls Dictionary, 1958, what they call the most authoritative dictionaries in the 19th century. And when it talks dragon, it says, it has this nucleus while the surrounding area forms something like a tail, beard, or tangled locks. Start with a tail. So it was no uh, space rock situation that you got in your rocky head right now, your knuckle head. You got to open that rock up and see clearly, man. Let it be framed in shape. Empty your cup and know that when you talk meteor or comet, you're referring directly to a star with a tail that, yes, sometimes might have a beard and some dreadlocks, man, some tangled locks, man. That's why they put the dragon head on the comet in the last vid that we just did. That's why we talk dragon. That's why we talk dragon is a meteor. Dragon is a meteor. Let's go, man. Or a prester, right? Let's go. Man, I mean, this is fun. This is fun when you don't even expect it. You know, when I, when my Ruach takes me in a whole nother, you know what I'm saying, um, lane, but it connects to even bigger things, man. I'll praise the creator. I know he's, he's flowing, man, because we're just talking about the Shawnee Chief Tecumseh, right? His name literally means shooting star, right? Let's get that. Uh, oh, it's this one right here. There we go. His name meant shooting star. All right, Tukumsa, Tukumsa. And uh, love to Jackie Anthony. This Sa, what does the Sa mean? Oh, do we still got that up? Some drop on that. Let's see if we can put it up here. <laughs> Check this out. So the Sa, Tecum Sa, all right, Tecum Sa, literally means what? One of the, one of a flock, a sheep, goat, lamb, man. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So when we talk sacrifices, you are the sacrifice, man. Ain't no more bloodshed necessary enough is enough to kum sa we're talking the sacrifice man dying for you dying to further you dying to protect you dying to seal your land dragon canoe we're talking chickamauga man shani we're talking to kum sa sheep goat lamb Sacrifice, burnt offering, man. Come on. Who are we talking about? Tukumsa, man. Whose name means shooting star. And we know that shooting star literally means what? Dragon. So let's keep going. Oh, this is crazy, man. Uh, you know, I always... You know, get in this link. We talk about the Saracens and the Papabu, 1452, saying subjugate these Saracens. And we know that 
when they say Saracen, they're only talking about us. Well, you know, I just happen to have this link still up, you know what I'm saying? But when you go on this Red Thread link now, guess what they did to it, man? Hold up, man. Where we at? Let's see. How oh, did they put it back? Ah, uh, look at that. On my other computer, the link was broke. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm still good on this. See if you could pull. I'm going to drop this link in this video. See if you could pull it up. Hopefully, it's still there. Because I tried to pull it up on my laptop. It would not pull up. So, hey. Hopeful, you know. This is just a reminder. You need to print this stuff out. Right? We need to start saving. Make sure you got hard copies of this stuff. Because they'll take it up. And then they'll take it back down. Alright? And then it's gone. So, where we at, man? We're just reading this great doc. Where we at? I'm getting really linky right now. Where my dot go? Gotta pull it back up. Let's see, man, I gotta go back in the drop chatter and get this thing. Yeah, yeah. All right. So get back in this doc, man. It's a history of this Lucifer conspiracy, man. But it's getting, it's going right in on what this fireball sighting with the Aztecs. This is when it came to the year 1519. Strange floating islands appeared off the coast. These floating islands are the ships they're talking about. Uh, the hijacks coming, who's claiming to have some connection with this prophecy of this. Kitsukotu. The men on these vessels wore beards and their God as their God had, they had also carried a cross, the Mayan symbol of the four cardinal directions. It doesn't say the Mayan symbol of Christ. So if you see someone with a cross indigenously, it has nothing to do with what these people on these floating islands are bringing over. Their cross has something to do with the cardinal directions I or the intersecting lines or a lot of different connections with these two cross sticks such as the Hebrew towel the Hebrew towel well, let's back it up because it gets better back it way let's get it to let's dig on it from right here man oh they got the Perry they got some Perry Reese mat drop man they got some drop in here man all right, all right, all right. All right, let's pick it up from here, and then uh, we're gonna talk about what is a cloud. We're gonna get into clouds because obviously, when you look up cloud, you know, you might just think cloud, but they get real detailed. They talk about theophonic clouds, then they talk about this transient situation. something transient which is you know pretty much something that you know well, we'll get to it we'll get to it all right we'll get to it because i want to you know cloud is mentioned over and over and over again in the script man when we talk cloud you know you got nothing but scripts talking about what these clouds are so we're going to dig on clouds man for the dismount let's get it from here Get fluty, man. Let's get a little fluty when we do it, man. I spent much I of my adult life exploring our past. Hijack, 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 hijack. I had the opportunity. It's a, nice little, it's a nice little flow right here. Let's get this flow. Let's go. All right, Perry Meese, Perry Reese map. It's a very important map. Talks about you know Antarctica. I. They got Antarctica mapped out before it even had ice around 1500s. So we say, well, how long has Antarctica really been covered by ice? If there's a map in the 1500s that has Antarctica mapped out with no ice. So, you know, these are good questions to ask. Did some recent spell hit Antarctica? You know what I mean? 
you know, 1811, all these resets, all these things going down. So let's go. It says, did Christopher Columbus really have ancient knowledge of the earth? Many are surprised there is proof that he did. The historian Las Casas documented that Columbus had a world map, which he showed to King Ferdinand, convincing him to back Columbus's expedition. There is an old map dating 1513, which was created by an Admiral Perry of the Turkish Navy, or Perry Reese, in which he had inscribed a lot of curious information. Not only does this old map show Earth divided into accurate lines of longitude and latitude, which was impossible until 250 years later when the chronometer was developed, but it shows the Falkland Islands, which were not discovered for another 80 years in 1592. Amazingly, the map also shows Antarctica, which was not discovered until 1818. Not only is Antarctica on the map, but it is drawn to have bays, islands, mountains, and rivers. It's not this big icy thing you think of today. You know, oh, research, research, research. They're researching the bays and islands, mountains and rivers and everything else that Admiral Byrd saw over there. He said, pass all that ice. He says, more land, more water, pass the ice. You just got to keep going. But you got to know you're on a plane, not a ball. You could, you could just keep going, keep walking, keep flying. You'll find more land, more water, more ice. Let's go. Not only is Antarctica on the map, but it is drawn at bays, islands, mountains, and rivers. Today, the continent on the bottom of the world is covered by an ice sheet over a kilometer thick. Today, there's an ice sheet over a kilometer thick. This seems like some magical spell that hit this place, man. What does this got to do with Atlantis, man? You know what I'm saying? It became credibly obvious in the early 1970s when satellite mapping was sophisticated enough to see through the Antarctic ice sheets that the Perry Reese map shows the continent exactly how it is below the glacier. That's why this is such a secret map, because they, they don't want you to know what they're digging on. They got the map, and they're over there di digging and drilling, trying to get under the ice. But in the 1500s, there's a map that shows no ice. So it leads you to the only rational conclusion that something happened. Something magical happened. Something epic happened to put this magical place under a kilometer of ice. A glacier of ice. The Perry Reese map also shows all the shores along the entire Atlantic Ocean. It ain't play play, including those of North and South America. Perry wrote on this map that he had copied it from a map once in possession of Christopher Columbus. He then stated that Columbus had copied his own map from another that had been drawn in the time of Alexander the Great. Hmm. Recall that Alexander, Alexander was in receipt of the ocean-going Phoenician secrets once he conquered Tyre. It is known that Greek scholars fled to Italy before the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which is one year after the Pope Nicholas Papal Bull Dom Diverses 1452, saying subjugate all these Saracens. Saracen, what is this Saracen land, man? What does this Saracen land have to do with Antarctica or Shambhala? So no matter if it was, you know, in the 1500s or you want to go back further than that, that's cool. But it seems to have everything to do with the fall of Atlantis, man. Which is Noah's flood, man. You know what I'm saying? When you look at it. Let's get it from here. Did they take with them ancient maps of the earth? Columbus was a cartographer by trade. It is known that he traveled widely throughout Europe, always searching for maps. Did he find an ancient Greek map which showed the entire Atlantic? Remember, evidence of the Greeks and Phoenicians have been found in Mesoamerica and Greek philosophers such as Plato spoke of far-off continents. There was, an, there was an island opposite the strait 
which you call the Pillar of Hercules, an island bigger, larger than Libya and Asia combined. All of Africa, all of Asia, there's an island larger than that where from it travelers could, could in those days reach other islands and from them the opposite whole continent. It's like the entire Atlantic Ocean, so to speak. But did it shift? Are we talking Greenland? Are we talking Antarctica? I hear all the theories, right? And then we even hear that Atlantis is rising out of Yellowstone. I mean, so the first landmass described, the one being larger than Libya and Asia, would be Atlantis, which Plato was describing. The next landmass, the whole opposite continent, could only be the Americas. Here we are. Who's the American? The copper color race is found here by the European. The copper color race is found here by the European. The Saracen, right? Pope Nicholas said what? Subjugate the Saracens, right? The dragons, right? These male or females that are fierce and violent. Fierce and violent towards the hijack. We're talking the comments, the media. I mean, yeah, man, you're definitely talking the Khan dynasty, otherwise known as the Americans priesthood. And you're damn sure talking about the aboriginals or copper color races that were just now found here by the European. Saracen, right? Something happened at this 1812 period. Something happened that became the last stand for Tecumesh Sa, the land. His brother, the prophet. This was a war going on, a war going on, man. Oh, yeah. Let's check out this Paris map. Is this evidence of a very advanced prehistoric civilization? Yeah, well, yeah, we're talking Atlantis, right? But see how the map just fits everything, man. Just a little slab of it, a little fragment of it. Mapping out Antarctica. No ice. Islands. Mountains. Waters. Rivers. I'll leave this link so you can uh, check it out further, man. Get your zoom on, you know. We're showing how these ridges would fit right in. If we're talking Atlantis, like, especially if you're talking the shift. You know, if Antarctica shifted, you know what I mean? Man, interesting, bro. Interesting. If the Phoenicians or the Greeks didn't make the map, who did? All right, so. Yeah, let me get this. It's actually very important. If the Phoenicians or the Greeks didn't make the map, who did? Charles H. Hapgood wrote in Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings that the Perry Reese map had as a latitude or latitudinal center the Great Pyramid. One certainly cannot put it past the ancient Egyptians. After all, they were associating with the Watchers. Another theory is that Columbus received documents from his father-in-law, who was a senior member of the Knights of Christ, secret society. Okay, We know that Columbo had a fairly accurate idea of how long his voyage should take even before he left. 
He had exactly enough food and supplies when his crew grew uneasy selling forever west. He was able to calm them by telling them precisely how much longer they would be out. Months into Columbus's journey, his diary tells us he had seen strange unidentified objects and lights flying through the sky. Mm -hmm. The night before he sighted the new world, so he was looking at dragons, dragons everywhere. It is also known that he heard voices that he believed were the spirit world telling him that the land he was about to found, found was to be New Jerusalem. Was to be New Jerusalem. Nah, man, he's coming to the ancient Jerusalem. He was told he was about to fulfill Bible prophecy and found a spiritual utopia, idea central to Rosicrucian philosophy. That's how they're flipping finding you right finding finding you let's go so they're finding you over here and they're talking about a spiritual utopia which Columbus is also looking for paradise Eden Rarema tree of life When, this, when Columbus discovered America in 1492, he referred to the natives there as Indians. He thought he was in the eastern shore of India. With this crusade was still on the minds of the settlers, the firstborn of the American settlement was Salam in Massachusetts, short for Jerusalem. Another was New Jersey, short for New Jerusalem. Copper color race is found here, right? Now, quickly, let's get on these giants, man. Giants in the New World. After Columbus, many expeditions and explorers follow. The famous explorer Magellan, who sailed around the southern parts of Argentina and Chile in 1520, reported an encounter with the race of giants. Magellan referred to these giants as Pantagons or Bigfoot because of their big feet. This area later became known as Patagonia, Pigafetti. A member of Magellan's crew documented a man so tall that their head scarcely came up to his waist. His voice was that of a bull. Okay. His voice was that of a bull. Man, what y'all think that means, man? What y'all think that means, man? Look, man, you know, these are theories that you can feel free to, you know, dig on. You know what I'm saying? You know, don't just wait for, you know, someone else to dig on it. You got to dig on it. They managed to capture two of these giants to take back to Europe, but they died en route. Later in 1578, so back to this giants and King of Og business, or, or all King of Bashan. Uh, later in 1578, the ship's chaplain aboard Sir Francis Drake's ship recorded in his journal that he had come to Magellan, come across Magellan's Pantagonian race of giants, inhabiting the southern tip of South America. Now, the southern tip of South America, digging on that Perry Reese map, I mean, that's Antarctica, man. All right. So Antarctica literally touches the southern tip or the southern tip of Antarctica touches Antarctica on some maps. So you have these giants. You have Antarctica. Let's go. While docked in the port of San Julian, some of Drake's crew got into a fight with these men of large stature and two crew members died. These men were more than seven and a half feet tall. Which is another point. Although sometimes we do talk 10 foot giants. A lot of times when we talk giants, they're around that 7, 8 foot, 9 foot range. And you know, we got some giants walking around today, man. It's called the NBA, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> nah. But yeah, I mean, we, we got 7 foot noggers today. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it just makes you think a little bit. But we know also they got giant giants. All right? In the 1590s, Anthony Nivet who sailed with Sir Thomas Cavendish, also reported seeing giants in the same region. The dead body of one measured more than 12 feet in length. In 1598, 10-foot-tall natives were seen and documented by Sebald de Weert. In 1776, the crew of the ship commanded by Commodore John Bryan, the Dolphin, after circumnavigating the globe, I mean, going in, he was just going in circles around uh, an island <laughs> upon return to to London leaked that he had encountered the tribe of nine foot giants in Patagonia and their story appeared 
in print in gentlemen's magazine and other newspapers such as the London Chronicle. Most remember Charles Darwin for his theory of evolution, but few recall he documented citing the Southern or South American giants in his book, The Voyage of the Beagle. Altogether, they were certainly the tallest race we ever saw. In 1880, the Roca expedition to South America boasted that, that they had wiped out the tribal giants, which had referred to themselves as Tehuelches, Tehuelches, something like that. Since then, no one had ever reported seeing any trace of Pantagonian giants again. When the Spanish explorer and conquistador Captain Cortez came to the Americas in 1519, he learned of the natives' reverence for the giants. Cortez chronicler Bernal Diaz de Castillo wrote, They said that their ancestors had told them in the times past that there had lived among them men and women of giant size with huge bones, and because they were a very bad people of evil manners, they fought with them and killed them, and those who remained had died off. Now stop right quick, because we're just talking about it. Now here we're going to talk Kitsukoto, right? And I'm telling you that this Kitsukoto is Joshua. Just dig on that. Just surf the wave. Surf the wave. Surf the wave. Possibly surf the wave, right? So if Kitsukoto is Joshua, we're talking Aztecs. We're talking Joshua fighting giants, right? Joshua fighting giants, right? So let's go. We have Kitsukoto. We have giants. We have Joshua. We have giants. Remember the tribes were afraid to go into certain lands because giants were there? We're talking about the history right here in America. The copper color racist family. The Saracen, right? Come on, man. You got to put it together. So, they brought us the leg bone of one that was very thick and a man of height of ordinary stature that was... The bone, that was the bone from hip to knee. So, a man with ordinary stature, literally this, this bone from hip to knee was the, was the height of a man of ordinary stature. Right? So, these are giant giants. We were all amazed at seeing those bones and felt sure that there must have been giants in this country. Our Captain Cortez said to us that it might be well to send the bone to Castile so that the, his majesty might see it so we sent it with the first of our agents who were there all right and then they got this whole situation with these fireballs in the sky man fireballs in the sky and again we're seeing fireball reports fireball reports hold up let me update it man let, let, let's see if there's any new yeah we got some new fireballs just coming in california louisiana Missouri, Michigan, Minnesota, 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 Colorado, Georgia, Alabama. Oh, I mean, these are dragons in the sky. These are comets in the sky. These are the fireballs in the sky. The fireballs in the sky, man. It's oh, amazing, man. So we're going to do our dismount right here. Just talking a little cloud drop, man. A little cloud drop. Ain't nothing too heavy. Fall back. All right, so we got, you know, we're, we're keeping it biblical, right? Because we're talking giants, we're talking Joshua, we're talking Kitsukoda, which is Joshua. We're talking priests and priest kings. We're talking the Khans, man. We're talking Jerusalem. We're talking Columbus. We're talking about he's over here, you know, looking for paradise. So all this is bringing the scriptures to life. We're talking dragons, which are the seraphs, which are the angels, bringing it to life. So everything we're doing, don't think we're, Outside of, you know, what's happening in scripture, what we're doing is bringing it to life, but really, you know, becoming hijack free and not just taking, you know, this version of the story or that version of the story, but digging on it in comparison to the indigenous truth, man. Because the indigenous truth you're digging on is the drop. And you're realizing that it has a lot to do with the biblical story, but the biblical story came out of that. You came first. You are the story. You're the Bible. You're the tribes. Your history is what matters because your history is what the prophets are writing about. The prophecies are about you. So stop chasing the hijack and stop hijacking yourself. Now let's get to this Anon. 
And you might, you know, we got a lot of researchers. As soon as they see Anna and all kind of things pop up. But that's what we mean when we talk clouds, man. We talk clouds, we're talking H6051. H6051 in the strongest coordinates, which is what? Anna. <laughs> what does that got to do with alien? I don't know. I don't know. Let's go, man. You know, Straits of Anna. Anna. All right, all right, all right. Now it says cloud, cloudy, cloud mass, all right? A cloud mass of theophonic clouds, number one. Yeah, okay. Let's talk theophonic. Because... It's pretty much every cloud situation in the scripture is going to come to that same Hebrew root, root verb, Anna. All right. Theophany, ancient Greek. All right. So you're back in the mind of a hijack. Theophonic clouds, go back to theophany, is the appearance of a deity to a human. Now, it's not saying it's the appearance of a human or a deity as a human. It's saying it's the appearance of a deity, a god or an Elohim or a seraphim to a human. So when a seraph or a dragon or an angel or a god or an Elohim appearance of God. Or appearance of a deity to a human. Let's go back. I'm just trying to break down this cloud situation, man. Because over and over again in the script, Genesis, Exodus, all throughout Exodus, you got cloud, cloud, cloud. We go, man. All right, you got. Um, Leviticus, Numbers, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. On and on. Cloud, 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 cloud. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that a bow shall be seen, right? A rainbow shall be seen. A Quetzalcoatl, a rainbow dragon shall be seen. We're talking clouds, which means we're talking Anna. A cloud as covering and veiling over the heavens so a cloud is referring to something that's covering or veiling over the heavens anything that's covering or veiling over you would be a cloud not just like a puff of white smoke thing you know but if it's veiling over you over the heaven compare as a cloud from the root to cover anything that's covering over your head. Right? The children are, are leaving the exodus following a cloud, right? But this cloud is just something that's hovering over, it's veiling over, it's it's covering. A cloud from the root to cover. A very large army is compared to a cloud. A very large army is compared to a cloud. In Ezekiel 30 and 38, a morning cloud is used as an image of something transient. What's transient? 1828 transient. Something that is passing, not stationary. A moving, hovering object is a cloud. We're breaking all this stuff down, man. Wakey, wakey, man. This is the apocalypse, which means what? It's the unveiling. Unveiling is an apocalypse. Something that when it's being unveiled, revealed. But you are talking about a cloud, which is transient, not stationary, and hovering or covering. Hovering, covering. To veil over. A cloud from root to cover.
This is from BibleStudyTools.com, Cloud, Cloud of the Lord, Old Testament, the literal cloud. All right, you have the literal cloud. Natural phenomenon involving clouds are depicted occasionally in the Old Testament, but far from being only natural, these are invariably linked with the direct activity of God. Especially in the books of Job and Psalms, cloud-related phenomenon are described as evidence of God's mighty, wondrous works in inscrutable ways. All right, then you got the rainbow, the rainbow clouds. All right, the rainbow in the clouds is a sign of the covenant. Dig on Kitsukoto, you're going to, you know, just go Kitsukoto, Rainbow Dragon, and you're going to see Quetzal is this multicolored bird. It is a rainbow dragon, a feathered rainbow dragon with a beard and tangled locks. And it's a sign in the clouds when this Joshua or Kitsukoto appears. And clouds themselves are presented as witnesses to the surety of the covenant of David. The clouds are the witnesses. The ones that are covering. Hold on, man. You talking about what? Hold on, man. We're talking about the prophecy. We're talking about the shooting star, right? We're talking about the clouds. Go to Psalms 89. Psalms 89, verse 37. His seed shall endure forever in his throne as a sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon. As a faithful witness in heaven, say la. So I must say, as a cloud in another version, you know, check your other versions. My covenant will I not break it, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Let's check out uh, some other translations here. Just looking at different translations of this, see if any of these have this cloud situation. Let's say it shall be established forever, like the moon, like the moon, like the moon. So that's interesting. You know, we'll dig on that some more about this covenant situation. Because here it says the and the clouds themselves are presented as witnesses. To the surety of the covenant of David with David. Withholding of rain from the clouds is seen as divine activity in fulfillment of the covenant curses. So you have the metaphorical cloud. The Bible writers frequently employ phenomenon of cloud formation and activity in order to metaphorically er illustrate aspects of their theological message. All right. Then you got the theophonic clouds that's what we were just talking about the most common usage of the hebrew terms for clouds comes into context of divine theophany that's when we start digging on theophany you know just a quick dig we're just digging around you know digging on these clouds because it's not just a puff of white smoke thing you know what i mean it's a covering 
And when you talk about theophany, you're talking specifically about the appearance of a deity to a human. So these are clouds related to someone coming down from a cloud or some type of appearance of a deity. The term has been used to refer to appearances of the gods in the ancient Greek and Near Eastern religions. All right, so only a number, small number of theophanies are found in the Hebrew Bible, also as the as the Old Testament. And you can keep digging on, you know, the new new. All right, so, but this says by far the largest group, about fifty occurrences of these, refer to visible manifestation of divine presence during Israel's exodus. From Egypt and wilderness wandering, the sign of God's presence is termed variously pillar of cloud plus 11 times pillar of fire and cloud, fire, fire, dragon, fire and cloud, a thick cloud. All right. And you remember we got in um, Psalms 18, we get this for the dismount. We're just talking clouds. We're just talking theophany, the appearance of a deity or a seraph or a dragon right? or an angel, angel, dragon. Let's go. We're talking the signs. We're talking the omens. We're talking Hawa. Because remember, this is the Psalm of David. Hawa is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my power, my strength in whom I will trust. My buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower, I will call upon Hawa, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death come past me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell come past me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon who? The Creator, and cried unto my God, my power, my creator he heard my voice out of his temple so follow the story that david is breaking down in psalms 18 we're gonna get this for the dismount david is distressed he crawl he calls out and hawa the creator hears the cry in his temple so this Creator is in a temple at this moment, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. So the Creator has ears in this moment. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because of his wrath. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. So the creator has ears in this moment, nostrils, and a mouth. He's in his temple. Here's the cry of David. He gets pissed at what's going down. And smoke comes out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also <laughs> and came down and darkness was under his feet and he rode upon a cherub and did fly yeah he did fly upon the wings of the wind he made darkness his secret place like a dragon lair his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. A cloud. A covering. To cover, to veil over. Something transient, right? Remember something transient is something that is not stationary, hence a short duration, not permanent, is disappearing, it's here, it's gone, not lasting or durable. How transient are the pleasures of this life? Momentary. So these are momentary 
deities appearing, right? We're talking theophany. These are the appearance of Hawa or the appearance of a deity or an angel of Hawa or a dragon of Hawa that is doing what? Covering, covering, hovering for a moment in transient. In transit, right? Passing by or appearing and then gone. Kind of like a comet. You know, they, they got stories that these comets sometimes hung around and hovered over them and then, you know, helped them out or caused this and did this. Star what they tell. So we're just getting the drop, man. We're just remembering. You know, we put it all together. All these comments had a had a meaning. And we're waking up to the same, you know, questions. What's a cloud? What's an angel? You know, where am I? Who am I? Where's my things? Where's my stuff? Where's my staff? Where's my land? And the Most High has promised the unveiling, the apocalypse, the remembering, the redemption of Yashara. Stay up. Suit up. Choose up.